Hey, I'm going to try and make this quick because uh, it's getting late. And uh, I've created a PDF here with a bunch of different little things. I'm going to go through kind of quickly. And um, I'm sharing this PDF with uh, a technician at Chief Architect. But I also want to share this with um, Madik Bim, who is uh, Nathan Wilkerson. I uh, hope I pronounced that right. Well, I've been really impressed with SketchUp lately, especially the work that Nathan has done. And this is what I would like to get out of the software, whoever, whoever builds this. Um, as a framer, I made all my own cut sheets. And I will uh, zoom in and kind of show you a little bit about what's going on. Uh, this was a kind of a complicated little house back in um, Tennessee, Germantown, outside of Memphis. And this is a 9 and 12 and 14 and 12. And as you can see, i got all these numbers along here. These are feet, inches, and 16th. So when you look over here on the right, that's what's going on. Um, the third number is 16th. So if it was 5, 9, 12... Come over here, 12 is like 12 sixteenths, which is three quarters. So five nine twelve is five foot nine and three quarters. And after you start using this system, it'll make a lot of sense. And the reason why I went with feet inch 16 is it's very uniform, it's very easy. You start seeing the numbers over and over, and they make sense because it's feet dash inch dash sixteenth. If I was doing this, like look over here, valley mark. 8, 11, and 3 quarter, and fractions. And the fractions are smaller than the actual cut length. And so you can see where this one here, all in this corner, look how small the fractions are. you got to zoom in. And so I did it both ways and um, laminated this whole thing. I think I printed this at 11 by 17. I did this a long time ago, I think. What was it? 2000, 2005, maybe. Uh, 2005, yeah, Two, somewhere around between 2004 and 2006. But anyways, um, every part of a roof can be calculated. Even these little floating hips, they can be calculated because it's just a matter of subtracting you know, um, a run from another run and the thickness of a ridge. And then that gives you a new run that you can calculate. Um, this little number right here, nine and five sixteenths, that's how much the hip comes back from the true corner and sits up on a wall and, or I'm not on a wall, but like a raised plate. Um, somewhere over here. Yeah, here we go. So, this is one of the, oh man, it is getting late. See how this is working? What happens is they want the same um, overhang. And to get that with a steeper pitch, you have to raise the pitch so that the tails meet at the same uh, subfascia or inside edge of fascia. And then um, why I wanted... Um, to bring this to uh, Nathan, whoops, was if he, uh, he's already got uh, SketchUp to be accurate. I was checking the jack lengths. And jacks are measured from the long point of the compound cut of the, you know, the angle bevel down to the outside of the framed wall the framing and um, along the top of the board. And when I was doing uh, roof framing and having Chief do it, it was giving me the length of the center line, somewhere around the center line, because I wasn't really sure if it was going to the um, the invisible um, theoretical center line. But it was it, on the other end, it was going all the way out to uh, over the fascia. So what I think is happening is their model has a giant roof plane. Um, I don't know if it's a solid or a face or whatever. And at that dimension of where that 
jack is, it's giving me that length. And that length is for the entire rafter plus a little bit. And I've done a video before where I showed just on common rafters how to get the number that they're giving for the length of that rafter. If you take that diagonal that they give you and then uh, enter that as the diagonal and then enter the roof pitch and hit run, you end up having a run that's longer than the half span. So that can't be right. Anyways, so um, this is how I've always done roofs. Once, I mean, in the beginning, I didn't know how to do any of this. But um, as I would sit at lunch in my car, uh, I would try to figure out the math of how we were building these houses because I just knew... And this was from high school math. I, this isn't anything advanced math, but I just knew that you could calculate all this stuff, and it just took me a while to figure it out. So here's some terminology. It uh, varies across the country and, and around the world. People call things different things. Um, Larry Belk and I have been collaborating quite a bit over the last month. And I called him and asked him how we should go about um, presenting terminology. And we agreed on span. So I've seen some books and some people have learned how they measure on the inside of the wall to the inside of the wall. And then they calculate things and they dimension the bottom edge of a rafter to get their rafter. And the only problem I have with that, well, I have a couple problems. One is you can't hook a tape on the inside, so somebody has to hold it. But what's more critical is that might work for uh, two by four walls where your seat cut is pretty close to three and a half and it still works with the uh, IRC code on rafter notching. But when you go to two by six walls or anything bigger, now you're having a problem because you won't have enough rafter left to go over the wall with any kind of thickness so the way i was shown and taught i believe is the right way you know because all framers think everything that they know is the only and right way <laughs> but uh, i was taught to hook over the framing to over the framing subtract the ridge thickness and then divide by two and that leaves me with over the framing to the face of the ridge is the run so that's what that's depicting here um when people talk about the rafter length, it's kind of uh, confusing because, yes, this is a rafter that goes all the way down to the outside subfascia. That's a rafter. But the rafter length is the angle along the top of the board from the face of the ridge down to the plumb line or vertical line of the outside of framing. And... I will show you that in just a moment, but I just wanted to leave this up here so you could read stuff, and uh, then I'll go to the next one. So here's the side view. So the run is from the face of, let's just make this bigger, the face of the ridge to a vertical line on the outside of framing. And you'll notice here I didn't put sheeting, so that's not really real but that here here's a picture straight out of the code book and they didn't put sheeting either so here they are calculating this notch and it's one fourth of whatever the depth of the rafter is and i'll show you where you start losing bearing when you start getting these deep pitches and those are the kind of roofs that uh, larry does if you ever wanted to see a complex roof you could look up larry belk go online and just go to his website and pick one of his uh, medium range houses like in the 7,000 square foot range and go look at some of the roofs he's designed. Um, here's These are just basic components of a uh, framed roof. And I picked 8 and 12 with a 20 foot span throughout this little presentation just so that when you see certain numbers, you'll see them again and, and you'll know that they're right. Like the rise, <clears throat> the actual rise is to the top of the ridge is the calculated rise plus hap and hap 
<laughs> Did I define that here? No. Well, it's height above plate, and you'll see it around here. All right, let's uh, shrink this back down. So, oh, come on. <laughs> I apologize. <coughs> I need to get a drink of water. Okay. Um, let me just do this. Let's go view as a single page. Oh, it is. Wow. Um, so just as a exercise in using chief architect as a 2d CAD program, I, I drew this Swanson speed square and I just had the real speed square on my desk and I just drew it and I didn't know if I'd ever need it, but it came in real handy right here because I wanted to talk about the components of a rafter and, uh, the way I've got this set up, this is going to be an eight and 12, uh, plum cut and plum just means vertical. And seat is horizontal. So I'll let you hit pause and you can read that. So here's the problem I have with the, the current IRC code for notching a rafter. Um, as it says here, this image is a screenshot. So this part here is straight out of the web version of the code book. I added this dashed line right here. Because when I looked at their diagram, they they cut the seat cut and then the rafter extends out into the room a little bit. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, but like when you want to put a two by six rafter up to a ridge, you always go to the next size bigger. Or if you're on a real steep pitch, you go to like a couple size bigger on the depth of the ridge. Because the code says that it has to be fully bearing. You can't have the rafter, you can't have a 2x6 rafter and a 2x6 ridge because there's like an inch or more of the 2x6 rafter that's hanging below the ridge and it's unsupported. And what that means is any kind of load on the roof, that 2x6 rafter can split because there's nothing holding that bottom cut part of the plumb cut. And so really the strength of that 2x6 is not a 2x6, it's it's, it's the thickness of a two by six, five and a half minus however much is not supported. And so that's what they, this diagram is a little off. It needs to be more accurate. So uh, that's what I was talking about here. You can read the bird's mouth part. Just hit pause. And then um, once you're done hitting pause, you'll hear me talk some more. The, um, the, where it gets into a problem is like Larry does a lot of houses with um, amazing roof lines. And if you were to follow the code and you're only allowed to notch out D4 in their diagram here, it's going um, parallel to the length of the rafter. Now, it wouldn't be so bad as if D4 was on the plump cut because then I could get more of a cut out and still have three three-fourths of the plumb line in the rafter and I would be able to sit more of that rafter on the plates but that's not how this is drawn and then this is weird too um, they draw it along the angle so up here in Washington State we do a lot of 24 inch overhangs but according to this that's not allowed um, if it's it can't be longer in the diagonal so that means like on this whatever this is I just copied this angle I just traced that angle so I don't even know what pitch that is but for this roof you could only have your overhang come out that far 21 and a half so that's kind of that needs some uh, review so here's um, this figure is out of the code book but I added a bunch of information to it I wanted to show, like, when it talks about lower third, middle third, upper third, I put those lines in and added some things that I've had to do. Um, like in in some places, like in Memphis, for example, they put the, whoa, man, i got to stop scrolling. I keep thinking I'm zooming in. <laughs> um, they put the rafters on top of plates on, that are on top of subfloor that are on top of joists. Um and sometimes that comes in real handy when you need that extra space or if you've got a nice steep roof with a decent overhang and 
you don't want your fascia hanging down into the window so that you're when you're looking out the window you're looking up at the bottom edge of your fascia but also it's cool because in some instances when you want to draw a uh, what i call a tennessee bonus room they would frame the garage with 14 foot high walls and then they would put the floor system in and the ceiling would be like nine one and an eighth or whatever and you would have a balloon framed wall up here that you could then put your roof on and you'd have a massive bonus room over the garage um but in memphis because it's seismic zone d2 which is just like on the west coast here they're in the uh, new madrid fault line area of the what is that called there's a giant big plate on the earth and if you watch dutch sense on youtube um, he talks about it a lot he has a diagram he shows how the fault line goes across that part of the country the in memphis we did a lot of framing on mud island and they needed drag struts <clears throat> so not only were you putting metal and connectors because the the code wants the the ceiling joist and the rafter to sit on the same wall so that you can nail whatever number of nails usually three from the joist through into the rafter and then you come back from the rafter into the joist with three more or whatever the code requirement is um but since you're not able to attach the rafter and the joist with the nails in such a fashion, which would really provide a lot of shear, you know, each nail being a couple hundred pounds or more. Um, the the strapping helps, but then they want that drag strut way back like that so that it helps hold the rafter from ever wanting to pull out. And you're also going to brace your ridge. But another thing we did, which is done all the time, is a purlin. And a purlin, if whatever your rafter span is authorized in the table, um, if you're going farther than what's in the code book, then you have to put in a purlin somewhere to cut that span down because it acts as a like a, a support in a way that allows you. Now this rafter span is right here. You got a purlin. There's the rafter span, and there's the rafter span. You don't have a purlin. There's the rafter span. All right. So this is some. Wazoo 3, uh, what do you call it? It's not 3D. It's, uh, is it ISO? I, I can't remember. Orthograph? I don't know. I uh, I wanted to draw it on 30 degrees because I did this way back in the, I don't know, 11th grade. The green one is the main common, and it's at an 8 and 12, and I don't have the actual numbers. I just have the equations, so, you know, you can put in whatever numbers you want, but that would be like the main common and once you have the uh, run and then the pitch is given in the plans then you'll know the rise and then the rise dictates all these other ones uh, the rise can tell you what your end common is going to be and how far it's going to go out and, uh, and then it's a matter of how wide is your uh, your end run versus your main run and that will give you your hip and I don't know. I just tried a different way of uh, graphically explaining it because people learn different. You know, some humans uh, like one way and then other humans like another way. So, like, check this out. I hope this isn't too confusing. I was trying to read this book. It's the uh, <clears throat> Holy Grail of Framing, I think, by... Uh, sim airs and you can look it up it's a white book and with black lines on the front and he has a bunch of way more complex than this diagrams just page after page after page um if you want to dive into that kind of depth but this is a very simplistic one you start with a triangle that represents there's the rise there's the run and there's the pitch that's given you can calculate this length here. This is the rafter length. And some of you might be like, well, wait a sec. The rafter, it's got to go to the top of the ridge. Well, this drawing doesn't show the height above plate. So when you go to put a rafter in here, 
it's going to have that vertical adjustment. And so the whole rafter is going to adjust up. And so the top of the rafter will be at the top of the ridge. And this is the same 8 and 12. And the way this diagram works, um, if it's a common 8 and 12 all the way around, then you're going to go with whatever that run is. You're going to bring that run down here. And now when you connect that, now you've got the hip run. So this is the horizontal run of where the hip's going to lie on a common pitched roof. And then to get that diagonal... Um, Oh, and the other thing was, yeah, it people say, oh, yeah, the hip's always, um, if this is 8 and 12, the hip is 8 over 17. Well, actually, it's 8 over the root of 288, which is um, 12 squared plus 12 squared. And that's on any common pitch where all the pitches are the same all the way around. So it's like if this was a 6 and 12, your hip um, angle would be a 6 over the root of 288. And that turns out to be like, 16.97 so you your framing pencil can't even be that accurate so that's why everybody goes yeah rafters are something in 12 and hips on a common all the way around is the same something over 17 all right beat that one to death um so this is, um, I just wanted to try and figure out in my head how many different kinds of jacks I could come up with. So I came up with this uh, just crazy offset looking roof. And some of them, you know what, I, I just realized something. I don't have a lay on valley. So these valleys are actual boards. Like if these were two by six rafters, these would be two by eights or two by tens. That's what I need to add to this drawing. Because if it was a lay on, that would mean that all these rafters here go all the way down to this wall. And then you would uh, lay a flat board on top of, well, you'd probably deck most of that with plywood and then lay your board. And then these would come down and the cut would be long at the top to long at the bottom. And this would be a, just a, angled cut and this would be a compound cut at the bottom and it would sit on those um whatever you laid down usually we would lay down like a two by 12 something something that was pretty wide so that the jack would actually be fully supported and if it's not like let's say it's not fully supported then you got to slide another board up underneath it from the um the downhill side up under it so that all the jacks are fully supported. So that's cool. I've had this drawing for several years and just now talking about it, I I was given the gift of uh hey, you're not done yet. <laughs> so I guess I got to go and it'll be the 12 types of jacks. Yeah, this is what happens when I get tired. I get uh a, a loopy. Let's see. View uh zoom to fit. Let's do that. So all those different types of jacks. This is a very simple roof. This is a 20 foot in one direction, 30 foot in another. Like I said, take the span, subtract the ridge thickness, and then divide by two. And something else, um, sometimes ridges are thicker. Sometimes you might need a structural ridge. You know, you don't know. Sometimes it's not an inch and a half. Sometimes it's an inch and three quarter LVL. Same thing with hips. So don't get used to the idea that everything's always nominal lumber and it's always inch and a half and inch and a half and inch and a half. Um, inch and three quarter is becoming pretty common when people want to have uh, no nonsense hips and valleys. And especially on a valley. Valleys are the weakest part of a roof because um, the valley, you can set it in and brace it and do everything and it's set. But all the jacks come down. And if you're walking down a framed valley and you're stepping on these jacks, they're going to want to just, they're, they're wanting to slide off down towards gravity if you hit hard enough. In a hip, it's opposite. You step on them, and they want to push into the hip more, but out here in a valley, they want to slide off and go down. So it when you build a valley, and just so you know, there's no valleys in this diagram. These are all hips. But when you build a valley... Um, oh, you know what? 
I'm going to find, uh, yeah, give me just a second. No, you know what? I will do this later. Um, but anyways, I usually try to get valleys that are um, depth enough that I can run a ledger underneath all these. If this was a valley, I'll uh, rip a 2x4 with the backing angle and tuck it up tight up against the bottom of all these once I've got them all installed and nailed. Just as an added little bit, because in some parts, like up in Linden, they might get a snowstorm where they get four feet of really heavy wet snow. And so what's normally a 30-pound snow load becomes like a 50-pound snow load. And the last thing I want is for all that weight to start pulling nails loose and having um, valley jacks separating from the valley. So that's just something to consider. Always think about uh, the guy doing the roof work might be 300 pounds. So hook a brother up, right? Um, in this, this is how I would do a simple roof. Uh, and I always used to do this at night before uh, I would need to go cut it. The only reason is job site time is way more expensive than being off the job. Because when you're on the job site, uh, if you're taking time to do all these calculations and writing them down on a board, then you better not be the guy in charge because you got everybody waiting for you to tell them what to do. And they're standing around or you're trying to get them going and then you're off doing this and then you get called away for something else and you're going to make mistakes. So uh, it's a lot cheaper to be in your jammies at night, draw this out, run the calculator, make sure everything's correct put this in the laminator and then bring it to work and just start cutting. And you got no distractions, no mistakes, no fat fingers on the calculator. And uh, like I explained earlier, the uh, feet inch 16th uh, just works. It's very clean. Once you laminate it, uh, you, there's no, there's no messing around The The trust companies, they use this and I don't know why they use it. But for me, the reason why I got into it was, um, when I have a programmable calculator, a, a Hewlett Packard HP 50G, it has um, reverse Polish notation. So to do feet and inches and fractions, when I'm entering information, I'm doing all the calculations in decimal inches. And then there's not a tape measure that you can buy where you can pull the length in decimal inches. And secondly, I hate straight inches because if somebody says, hey, uh, go get me a 217.75 board. And I'll go, okay, I know the 0.75, that's three quarter, but 217. So I know 192 is 16 feet. So I got to do all this extra thinking, right? So whenever I worked with people, I would just constantly be like, feet in inches, feet in inches. I couldn't stand, oh, yeah, 69 or 5 eighths or whatever. Um, I just wanted feet and inches. And so to get the calculator to go from inch, uh, decimal inch, I had to create, um, well, the nice thing about RPN is it's stacked. So it's kind of like a vertical uh, matrix. It's like a what would it be a three one matrix i guess it stacks everything and then i can export the number so that it comes out um number comma number comma number and it took me a while but i couldn't there there would be no way i would have been able to figure out how to do fractions because i don't even know if you can i don't even know if you can generate a number of, with fractions in a scientific calculator so that's how it started and um, I'm pushing for this. I want my all my dimensions to be like this. And I get a lot of pushback from people. They're like, well, see this 30 here or this 20? Um, man, you deviate from that and you're going to get a lot of people getting all hot and like, why do you want to do it this way? Well, it works. And uh, when you get all your, if you do trusses, um, the trust paperwork, it comes like this. So for some reason, and it's it's a viable thing, that last number being a 16th is as close as you got to get in framing is 1 16th. It's always nice to shoot for excellent and perfect, but feet, inches, 16ths, easy peasy. 
So this is SketchUp, and this is from um, Nathan Wilkerson. And man, I'm about to go check his website to make sure I'm not mispronouncing his name or calling him something completely wrong. Um, but the, he built um, an extension. I guess it used to be called a plugin. He's got he's got several of them that he will sell, and it makes um, SketchUp do a lot of things automated. And one of the things is I dimensioned. Oh, I'm going to lose my mind. I scroll in and out all day long with the zoom wheel. But when you're in uh, this little PDF reader, nope, that's not how this works. So um, I was able to dimension with SketchUp uh, from the long point of each jack and go down to, and I had to create a line. I had to take a line and draw up the rafter to where it intersected with the top and do the same at the other end and then connect them. So this is kind of like a chalk line that's uh, on the outside of framing. So I have a place to measure to because otherwise there's no stopping this. And I needed to know what is it over framing to the face of the ridge, which is 11, 11 and 5 16 So remember that number because, uh, well, heck, let's just go confirm. Um, up here 11 11 and 5 16 look at that um, so he nailed it and then on these uh, jack I remember one of the jacks the first jacks was 10 4 and 5 8 and I'm going to explain something here view just to fit um, so when you see uh, dimensions on anything that I create those are horizontal because when you make a dimension there's no way that in 2d it knows what's going on here so when you see the feet inch 16th that's a calculation of the diagonal length so like right here 10 4 and 10 16th is 10 4 and 5 8 and that's right here 10 4 and 5 8 so what's cool about this is um chief didn't do this this way I, I don't know how they're doing the calculation but um one of the things that, that caught our attention larry noticed it when he was working with a different builder and i've noticed it where i i can't do cut sheets with chief is um Typically on a roof where all the pitches are all the same all the way around, one of your main commons, like this one right here, just rotates around and becomes an end common down the middle. And it should be the exact same length as these main commons. And the only difference is some software companies and some calculator companies, they try to use the imaginary center line that's... Um, you know, that the roof line is following and aim for that. And so they did. And the rafter on this type of roof is horizontally three quarters too short on each end. And that changes as the pitch changes. If this was a steeper pitch on the end, then it wouldn't be exactly three quarters. It, you could calculate it, but it, it wouldn't be. And, uh, and here's the final... This is something that I, I took the calculator. Man, this took me like two weeks. I took my, everything I had in my calculator to try and build a spreadsheet where I can type in feet, inches, sixteenths. And then this is all the data you need. I guess I could make that bigger. This is the data you need. Oh, son of a gun, please. I'm sorry for uh, giving you like shock headaches but anyway so this is all the data you need um it's not as simple as well i i got my run because uh you need to know well you don't really know no wall thickness but but i put that in there because if you have that information and you want to try a different calculation you've already got it so as long as you enter that stuff you need to know the overhang the subfascia thickness because some places don't use that. You put a zero in there. Uh, D 
different pitches. Hip thickness is really important because a lot of times now that's 1.75. And rafter thickness, um, it's not always inch and a half. It just depends what you're building. And we use a lot of uh, two by eight, so seven and a quarter. And a lot of people do 24 inch uh, layouts. So once you have all that, uh, the very first thing is down here. It calculates the height above plate right here. And then I had it re I had it read it up here just so I could see it. I wanted it up here. So that's uh, 4 and 4 sixteenths, which is 4 and a quarter. And the reason why you see 4 sixteenths is I have Excel turned on with fractions to a sixteenth. Um, but yeah, so there's... Uh, entered the span up there and then it comes down here and it tells me hey guess what span minus ridge divided by two is nine foot eleven and a quarter and that means your end run is the same because it's eight and twelve and eight and twelve like when you see where is it right here if i change any of these it updates all this and what's nice is <clears throat> larry pushed me to do this because I have it in my calculator, and I know it's right because I've checked it so many times, and it's correct compared to um, Chief or Chief uh, Construction Master and Build Calc and all those. Uh, they go to that theoretical center line, and what I've done is over time I've uh, figured out the equations to manage the thickness on angle. That's what you're actually doing. You're figuring out when I come over a certain horiz. I mean a uh, I'm coming over to the next layout and I hit the hip, I have to take off a certain amount of length. And it's length along the, the diagonal. It's on the slope. And once once you figure all that out, then it, after that, you're just subtracting the increment of the jacks. But there's that 11, 11, and 5 sixteenths. There's the tail. What was it? 17 and... In some pictures, it was 17 and 3 eighths. And in other places, it's 17 and 7 sixteenths. Um, that's only because some places like uh, XL might round a little different than Chief or AutoCAD or whatever, or Calculator. It all depends on how you set it up for rounding because usually it's within a sixteenth or exact, one of the two. There's the hip. 15 6 and 7 16 so i saw that number on the corner of one of the buildings and yeah go ahead check this out look at this and then go back and confirm um all this stuff is correct and that's it this is this pdf i got to get this over to uh nathan i just sent it to um nigel at uh chief so it sounds like they're interested in looking into this because if, I mean, there's a lot of people that use Chief for um, interior design and this probably doesn't mean anything to them. But I know for a fact if builders and framers and the guys putting the structures together had confidence that the software they're using were was giving them numbers that were actually usable, you know, instead of, Hey, the framer will figure it out on site. Well, not always. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to wing it. It's just way better to fully understand what you're doing before you even get to the job site. And if the software, I mean, it's in there. The database has this information. We just got to figure out how to create the right queries to get that information out. And then it's a matter of making it presentable. Like right now, Chief puts their default um, item label right in the middle. And it's, I don't know what, I never really looked into the text that that is controlling that, um, where to change that size, because it is kind of big. But it, even if you did, uh, you turned on uh, labels and callouts, or I can't remember the term, you'll have a bunch of circles with different numbers or wh however they... You know how, like, with a truss, it'll have TR-1, TR-2. It does that for rafters. But, man, the circles just come out so big that I don't think anybody even uses that for any reason. So that needs to be reworked where uh, the circle's not so not so huge. 
And then like what I like here is I would write justify everything up here so that all the numbers stayed tight and I would copy paste and then run the calculator, get the lengths and type them in and then laminate this whole bad boy. But if the software could do a uh, rafter cut thing, I don't know what you want to call that, but that'd be a whole new feature and it would definitely be in uh, people's interest to, to know Okay, everybody's like, oh, but you're willing to take the liability? That's what disclaimers are for. Because I'm telling you, there's a lot of DIYers out there that if you could help them get started like this, they would love it. And if there's a disclaimer, here's usually what happens. Because um, I've built whole houses in a factory in, in Tennessee. A buddy of mine uh, asked me to come help him start that. And you have to have in your contract that the foundation will be exactly as the plans call for it. And if it's off, you don't adjust framing. I mean, the, the plan is the contract. And if the framer is not following the plan because he's trying to help out the builder and the foundation guy, if anything gets thrown into court... He can't say he followed the plan. All they have to say is, did you deviate from the plan? And you're done. So we had to get kind of serious about holding people accountable, and especially on big, um, like, apartments and assisted living buildings. You have to, they have to hit it. I mean, if you're a foundation guy, be good at what you do and hit it. Get it right on. And then we have to frame exactly these spans so when we're raising our walls, they have to be done right. And we built all that stuff. We panelized walls and did everything, and then we cut the roof. And the guys that were setting the buildings up, they knew. Look at the plan, set the walls, brace them out, and make sure that when you hook over to over, it's exactly what it's supposed to be. So whatever, you know, like here, there's a, there's a run right there. So that way... I actually cut this one on the job site, but we sent out entire roofs, everything cut. And all the guys had to do, and labeling was kind of strange. We'd have to, that's why you see right here, uh, when I look at a, a hand-cut roof, I always start with the ridges, and I go, okay, ridge A, ridge B, because the ridge drives what's going on. A ridge will have hips and valleys connected to it and it'll have commons and jacks connected to it and each ridge is a different span and so that's how I delineated all this I drove the whole process by ridges here's a span 14-1 right here and from that span I know what the rafter is I know what the jacks are and I know the pitch is a 14 and 12 and so I know the run I know the rise and I know the valley length that I can cut right here. And I could even, yeah, like right here, valley mark. <laughs> so you can even use math to determine where to mark the valley so that you could bring your uh, valley up and put it on the ridge. And I wonder if I can zoom in. I want to show you something. Uh, when a hip and a valley come together like this, you have to leave a space. Let me, yeah, let's just one last little tidbit. Um, these two don't touch because what happens is you're planing that little dotted line when, when this side here is coming up and these rafters are planing to the top of this ridge right here they have to carry on up here so this floating hip is lifted up and it aims across and the top edge of this planes to the other side of this ridge. And so that's how these work is this planes to the this face on this side where you see my cursor. And then this one planes to the other side. And it just so happens that this is always almost an inch and a half. It just depends. Like this is all common. These are all, um, four, uh, what is this, 14 and 12? So yeah, it'd be inch and a half. 
it changes when you have um, different pitches. And man, I haven't framed a really super complex roof in a, I don't know, a decade maybe. Everything we've done up here that I've helped is simplistic. Or I shouldn't say simplistic. It's just uniform. Um, I'm going to bring a picture in here real quick. Let's see. Yeah. Let's see if I can open this in a open it in a new window. Yeah. So like I did this one. Um, this is a garage and it's all mostly valleys. This is a structural ridge that goes all the way down so that it's a gable on both ends. And this is like three and a half by 18, I believe. And then, uh, we ran these valleys up and they, they landed. Let me think how I did this. There was like three and a half inches between each, each one. Try to think why. Anyways, yeah, I drew all this stuff out, and in fact, here's the, this will probably explain it better. Let's open this in a new window. So I used AutoCAD on this one. How do you, where's this, view, zoom in. So, yeah, I drew all this with AutoCAD. Um, when we did the ridge, we put an extra 2 by plate on top so that we could plane all the rafters to that extra plate. And then when we were done, we pulled this plate off, and that made all the rafters stick up an inch and a half so that when you put your bird blocks and your venting, you could actually run a ridge vent along here and have convection. If we didn't... If we ran it to the ridge, we'd have to cut the plywood back, and we're already three and a half inches. So we were like, uh, you know, if you go too far back. And uh, the thing that's cool is all I had to do was design it and cut the roof because I was working with a builder whose son is meticulous. And so they did all the framing. They built the building. They installed all the rafters and stuff that I cut. And... Um, and it was fun working with them. It was during the fire, like three years ago, when we had all that smoke in Washington State. And I uh, broke my saw, and just a bunch of stuff happened. It was just goofy. But um, there's one more diagram that is uh, worth looking at to make you think about. Yeah, here it is. Um, this is the same drawing, just a different way. This is so I could keep track of what I was cutting. So the night before I did this other drawing, I got this all perfect where I knew what it was, but instead of having to think, okay, wait a sec, that's a, that's just a angled cut up there. And this is a compound cut. And I'm cutting it in this direction, and my saw has the blade on this side, so I'm going to have to cut this way. Instead of having to do all that, I decided it would be worth it to just lay the boards down in a way that if I'm standing here as the guy, and my blade's on the right, and I tilt my saw, I can just push away on this angle for all these. And then the same thing, I'm standing here, and I push away on this angle on all these. And so all I did was I, I cut the square angle, not square angle, but you know what I mean. I did the angle cut, and then I would pull along and draw the line and then cut. And that's how it kept me sane. And I just knew I had to do two of each one and stack them carefully so that I didn't mix anything up. And this became all, and this little, what you see right here, that's uh, the way the board's crowned. 
I just put a little arrow so I'd remember, crown it this way, cut this there, and then pull this and cut and mark, cut and mark, cut and mark. Do two of each, two of each, two of each. And the only negative of this whole project was the homeowner was buying the material. And man, was he cheap. He found some kind of goofy two bites and man, they were twisted and they were, he, he got a deal on them, I guess, but it's hard to make, it's hard to be good when the material sucks. That's the end of the story. Um, this is really cool to build. I had fun doing it. Uh, here's another picture from a different angle. On this one, I uh, I wanted to go out with a bang, so I uh, laid out everything on the hips, or I mean the valleys. And on here, I did the... I did the hip angle, which is wrong. It needs to be the plumb angle. So I, I got it right. As soon as I did this and I saw it wasn't lining up, I realized and I did, uh, I don't remember what this is, 12 and, I, I did a 12 and 12 hip instead of 12 and 12 common. But on the rest, I got them all. And it it's just a calculation to get the first. And then it's, um, it's a diagonal of your um, jack increment to go down the hip and just mark it off. And it just helps the guys, to, you know, they, they can see that it's staying true. So that when they go to run the plywood, everything's, everything works. And, um, and the bad part, the only bad part about this whole thing is they flattened the ceiling out just a little bit above this window. They, the homeowner wanted it joisted. And then, uh, so you don't see any of this anymore. It's all sheetrock. You see some sloped ceilings up until a point where it goes flat. Um, man, if it was my house, I'd want to leave it exposed because it felt like it just was awesome. But there you go. So I've run this video pretty long. Um, I just really want some software. So, okay, go to um, Solid Builder. And uh, they're out of Dubuque, Iowa. And watch some of their videos. They try to tell you that their software is the best and easiest. Okay, it's really good because it's the most accurate software I've ever used. But it's not user-friendly. The, the method for how you do things is not intuitive. And, and I'm coming from an AutoCAD background. And Chief was kind of hard to figure out in the beginning because I came from an AutoCAD background. But, um, but Solid Builder... What's amazing is they will give you a single sheet, if you want, a single PDF sheet for every single component in the building. So if you if you were cutting these, you drew this in the model, and then you said, okay, I need to print this roof plane. It will print off a single PDF page for each one of these and give you the length to the long point and the angle of the bevel, or the angle of the angle cut, and then the bevel for the angle cut, and... I mean, everything, the depth of the lumber. And um, then they also give you the whole roof plane and they have the lengths all the way down them. And then they have like a table or a schedule or whatever. And it has all that information, same information. And they're right. I mean, I've, I've checked them against my calculator, against spreadsheets, against reality, and they nail it. And they do, we used them in that uh, factory. They will give you uh, plywood cut sheets and you can come across the top go down a certain amount and then uh, come over to a measurement from the bottom cut it label it stack it and then when you reverse stack you get to the job site and you pull it off you're just laying it in and it fits exactly where it's supposed to go so it minimizes the waste like crazy but anyways so that's it um solid builder but they're clunky and uh Chief is the easiest for um, making uh, plans for permit and having a really professional and really easy to use, uh, create layouts that are awesome. Um, AutoCAD is king when it comes to 2D. And um, SketchUp is amazing. I, I was really turned off by SketchUp early because I don't know how to draw in 3D and it just feels clunky. But there's so many smart people out there. Um, like Larry says, 
He goes, uh, I have an entire digital lumber yard because he'll create all the different things. Like he'll create different, different rafters at different pitches at different lengths. He'll do different hips on different angles, um, for irregular pitch or common pitch and studs and plates and joists and you name it. And he'll keep it in a model a framing, like a general framing model. And it'll be all the parts you need. And you just go in and start drawing. And some of the things I've seen on videos are pretty good are, um, draw complicated things away from where you're going to be assembling everything so that you can work without having to not pick other things. And there's a book by John Brock that's uh, SketchUp for Builders. I was referred that book by Larry, and man, it's amazing what people can do with SketchUp. But I haven't touched their layout, so I don't know how hard or how easy that's going to be because I'm going to stay with Chief and I want Chief to uh, I really just want them to become an uh, unstoppable force so hopefully whatever it is I'm sharing here helps people and uh, I just want it accurate man it, it's just so nice when you can show up in the job site you don't have to think you don't. you've already worked it all out and then that way, if something does go sideways, you can. there's a couple things that happen. Something goes sideways, you've got time, and you can work it out and make it work. And the other thing that happens, especially when I, I do the same kind of detail work for rake walls, if you try to be perfect with every cut, every bevel, every angle, everything, and you, you make it awesome, um, and you lay everything out correctly, as you're building a rake wall or as you're putting these things in... Um, I use the term self-truing. The, um, the structure will actually straighten itself out and become as close to theoretical perfect as your level of tolerance allows. And Because um, we used to pop out rake walls like on the slab, and then you would measure the parts, and then you'd cut them, and you'd build it, and hey, there's your rake wall. And yeah, it works, but you could just tell, you know, you'll got to whack it with your hammer a little bit here and there and get it just to hold whatever. And then you, you think you're good. Well, you can be better if you don't have, don't waste the time popping it out on the ground. Just draw it in some CAD program, especially now if, man, if I can figure out how to make uh, SketchUp do this, uh, Rake Wall would be easy. And then you just dimension it, and you just now you know there's your bevel, there's your length, and then across the bottom plate and up the rake plate. Boom, done. So, you know, it's not work when you have fun. So, I'm having fun. And uh, I'm going to let you all go. I appreciate all the comments. I sure hope um, whatever it is I'm doing here, if it helps you, awesome. Um, one guy recommended reverting back to, uh, SketchUp 2022. And it was funny the way he said it. <laughs> he said, you don't know me. Just trust me. Just do it. Um, so evidently 2023 has issues. So I might do that. Um, he had an effective way of commenting. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I'll tell you what, um, Nathan at Madik Bim is amazing. You you got to check that out because um, I am a sucker for dead on accuracy, and he's a structural or he's a professional engineer from Washington State. And uh, yeah, some engineers are amazing. <clears throat> Most of them are. There's some that get a little, you know, I don't know. That I don't want to say anything bad, but I've worked with good ones. And I've worked with not so good ones. Um, David Bradley up in Bellingham, he's amazing. Um, but uh, I don't. I've never met Nathan. I, I bought his um, his full suite because uh, Larry said, "Oh, you're gonna love it." And man, it automates things. And and then when you measure him, you're like, "Whoa, this is dead on." And the coolest thing about SketchUp is uh, X-ray. I think I've shown you this. I messed up with, um, 
Let me do this. I messed up um, in one of his automated foundation uh, menus, and I didn't pick... Oh, wait, I don't want that. Uh, well, now I got a blank page. <laughs> um, I didn't pick the vertical uh, rebar. And where's... Uh, Where's open recent? There we go. Um, so my, oh, and you know what else? This stream deck is awesome. When I use, um, let's see, what do I want to do? I want to go here, click this. Now I'm in stream deck orbit. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm going to turn on x-ray. And I, I didn't pick the verticals, or so that's why they're missing. And I caught it when I was uh, looking over here, trying to go. Okay, shouldn't there be some verticals on this opening, this crawl space opening? But okay, so Chief does glass house, but it's all one color. It's all one kind of blue color. And from what I can understand, or what I gather, um, whatever color the uh, material is in regular. It just kind of makes that a little more translucent. Like this is a wood grain texture for these joists. And uh, I mean, I, I, things like this. Look, a three inch square washer on a 10 inch um, J bolt, anchor bolt, seven inch embedment minimum. I can't wait to see what the shear walls are like because he'll have all kinds of hold downs. Some of those are those uh, twisty, screwy. Um, threaded systems and the other ones are like the straps and let me just tell you don't do the straps straps are stupid um first they take about 40 nails or whatever but um you're putting a big piece of metal on a corner or on a doubled up or tripled up stud and then if you have to put siding over that you ha you have nowhere to nail so I've never liked the straps. I've always liked the uh, the H was it the HDU hold downs because they're in the wall, and people are, yeah well it's hard to hit it. Well, build a template when you're setting your forms so that you can set your anchors correctly in the concrete, and then because uh, the strap just sucks, it bulges things. Usually people will sheet the house and then they'll bend the strap up and they'll nail through the sheathing into you know two or three usually it's three um two by sixes with long ass nails like some of them spec uh three and a half inch 162 like sinkers and uh you try to run corner boards or siding or any of that stuff you, you got to deal with that and if you forget or if you need to tack something and you know that there's a two and a half inch plate that's three feet tall running out the corner of your building that sucks all right so i said i was gonna end this so here it is um y'all have a great day and uh i'll do another one later